welcome everyone and uh, it's wonderful to have you all and as uh, Amir Rana said a very honorable outspoken and distinguished guest today uh, to to talk to us about it and uh, we have people from various countries joining us uh, as usual uh, and this is our subject today as Amir Rana introduced introduced choking our planet to death the climate change causes impact and challenges and uh, as we all know that uh, there is a lot of hype in the media and worldwide conferences, discussions going on. And this topic is actually concerns all of us, regardless of our color, race, religion, faith, nationality, regardless of where we come from, what we believe in. But this topic is really very close to, to, to our hearts. Uh, before I go into that, a uh, very brief introduction of, uh, of the organization. But before that, uh, our today's program is dedicated to all victims of climate change. And then there have been millions in the world from refugees to victims of floods, et cetera. And all the heroes uh, like you guys who are fighting for a thriving planet. So this is the dedication of our today's program. Uh, introduction of OPP, as I said, very briefly, really, the purpose of this organization, which we started uh, just over six years ago, it's a platform for the people who endeavor to enhance cooperation among communities to promote progressive values. And our vision is unity in diversity. Uh, I wouldn't explain much uh, on that. And our mission is to strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. And today's dialogue is uh, one of those uh, endeavors uh, which we uh, regularly have. In addition to that, we are active in social media. Uh, our inclinations politically, we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights, gender equality, and we do not have any affiliation with any political party whatsoever. On the religious side, we believe in separation of uh, state and religion, and socially, we believe in inclusion, tolerance, acceptance, and harmony. Uh, and as I said, for more information, you can find us on various locations, and please do check and do contact us if you need any more information, you have questions, you want to participate more actively in the activities of OPP, uh, all support and help is really welcome. So please uh, look for us. Uh, back to today's topic. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what is uh, happening around the world. And I think you all are really very, very well aware of uh, what's happening. Just to put a little bit of background to that, to our today's topic, we have seen the emergence of uh, green movements since uh, 1960s and, uh, and, and the 70s. And we have seen that when these movements start, they were basically laughed at. No one took them seriously. They were waving the red flags even that long ago. Since more since 1995, we had 27 huge conferences worldwide uh, and widely covered by the press. We saw strong statements from the politicians and even some multinationals issuing uh, uh, statements in favor of environment and protecting the planet. But we have seen a lot of hypocrisy, compromises, diluted resolutions at the end of these conferences, lots of commitments which were unkept, lots of goals which were agreed but were unmet, and at the end of the all it all of it, they always said, but we have no funds to do this or to do that. The people were basically conned into, and I'm using the word conned, into fighting climate change as individuals. So very cleverly, I think they're, they're PR spinning machines. They made it a problem of the people, like of individuals. And you, you I'm sure you all know that the, 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 requests or guide we got from the governments, uh, use reusable pens, uh, take more stairs than elevators, uh, use public transport, do, do use uh, energy saving bulbs, uh, check before you buy a cheap t-shirt, uh, uh, eat less meat, uh, drive less, fly less, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But this all is okay. And this all individuals should do all these things because every little bit helps. But at the same time, the governments and all the uh, multinationals, they kept on 
increasing their efforts to stimulate consumption, boost growth, and maximize profits. And we have seen that the as they were talking about uh, uh, saving the planet, they were at the same time busy with privatization, with tax cuts for large multinationals, for deregulation for multinationals and the trade. They made free trade deals. They were moving production to cheaper countries. They were doing all the lobbying. They were curbing the rights of, uh, of uh, trade unions. And they were creating hyper individualism, promoting consumerism. Uh, I mean, look at the just the advertising last year. They, they on on consumer advertising, it was a, they spent seven hundred and sixty billion dollars, and telling us travel less, but at the same time promoting tourism, making billions and billions of dollars on tourism, coming up with things like Black Friday and Blue Monday. So really boosting consumerism and mass production, uh, but at the same time telling us to to save on these things. Uh, effects we uh, uh, all know very well, and I am sure we will, as we as we go through the, our discussion today, we will come to some of these uh, effects of climate change, and I am sure uh, Dr. Mujib will also address uh, the, the most serious aspects of uh, effects of climate change. So here are some of them which actually affects almost every single aspect of our life. Uh, so this, again, is a long list of the effects this, this climate changing is having on our planet, on our daily lives. And, and the irony is that these multinationals, they knew about it. I found this chart, which is very much these days in the press, that ExxonMobil in 1970s very accurately predicted, even scientists today are astonished that they had such an accurate prediction how the global warming is going to evolve in the in the coming years. And they, so they knew it. It's a bit like uh, like the cigarette industry, uh, you know, they knew about it uh, right from the start that it's damaging to your health, but they kept on promoting it. Causes of climate change, again, we, I'm sure as we go through our discussion today, we will address some of these, uh, these points. A lot of them are, uh, some of them are uh, uh, natural disasters, but most of them are man-made disasters. So these are, uh, but we kept on closing our eyes to that. Uh, I have a quote here from Milton Friedman, and I'm sure you know him. He was the guru of uh, uh, neoliberalism and uh, uh, and neo-capitalism. And he said, the only corporate social responsibility a company has is to maximize its profits. So this is really at the core, at the essence of this, this, this whole discussion. It's not about just uh, uh, that they ask us to uh, use uh, different uh, light bulbs, but their basic drive and their basic motivation is to maximize their profits. And that's what they think their job is to do. Uh, and that has an impact, of course. And if we look at this chart, uh, you don't need to go through the details. Again, if you see the horizontal uh, green uh, line at the top, the richest 10% are responsible for half of pollution in the world. This is what it basically says, that the, that the, uh, the, the emissions uh, coming from the lifestyle of the people and these are the top 10% which contribute 50% uh, to CO2 emissions. So this is the equation we are talking. So we can do and we must do all these small steps, but the biggest steps have to come from somewhere else. Uh, having said that, uh, putting the slight context, uh, context around our topic today, I would like to welcome and uh, introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Mujib Latif. Uh, Thank you, Latif Saab, for agreeing to, to coming to us and uh, being part of uh, our movement and our group and addressing uh, today's session. He is a German meteorologist and oceanographer of Pakistani descent. And we, we say this a bit of sense of pride, of course, uh, otherwise nationalities and these things don't matter. Professor, Professor Dr. Latif took a position as scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in 1985 and earned his PhD. His doctoral thesis supervisor has been Klaus Hasselmann, who was awarded the Physics Nobel Prize of 2021. In 2003, uh, Professor Dr. Mujib Latif became professor at University of Kiel. 
He is president of Akademie der Wissenschaften Hamburg and president Deutsche Gesellschaft Club of Rome. Professor Dr. Mujib Latif is a regular guest at TV discussions and about global warming. And I would really, really recommend it strongly to, to all of you and your friends to really go to the YouTube, go to media, internet, look for his lectures and talk shows. They are extremely educative and illuminating, uh, and we learn a lot from them. So having said that, I uh, give the floor to, uh, we stop sharing. So I have stopped sharing the screen and the floor is all yours, uh, Professor Latif. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, for the introduction. I prepared a presentation, so, but I don't have the right to share the screen. So maybe I can become co-host uh, or get the right to share the screen. Yes, sir. I have made you co-host. Okay. You can share. Oh, yeah. Now it works. <clears throat> Okay. So, yeah, uh, the title has been announced. Uh, so the topic is climate change, uh, causes, impacts, and challenges. And uh, 2022 was really uh, a very special year because uh, we featured a lot of uh, uh, weather, severe weather and, and, and disasters like the flood in Pakistan, uh, which hit more than 30 million people, more than seven, 1,700 uh, people died. And uh, so uh, the country is still uh, trying to recover uh, from this extreme event. Now, if we talk uh, about climate change, well, what we mean is global warming. And uh, you see on the left a little movie, uh, a kind of climate clock, uh, which uh, depicts the evolution of the globally average surface temperature since uh, the start of industrialization. So basically since 1850. And uh, uh, you see basically two circles in there, uh, two red circles, uh, one, uh, is the 1.5 degree circle and the other is the two degree circle. And uh, these two figures are part of the Paris Agreement, which was uh, ratified in 2016. It was uh, negotiated in 2015. And what it says in the Paris Agreement is that uh, the countries uh, uh, would like to limit global warming to well below two degrees relative to pre-industrial times and take all action to limit global warming even to 1.5 degree. Now, if you look at this spiral as it develops, uh, you see that we are already very close to the 1.5 uh, degree. Um, and uh, I think, and I think uh, most uh, colleagues agree on that, uh, we will fail at least uh, to limit global warming to 1.5 degree, even limiting it to two degrees uh, uh, would be a, a grand challenge and policies, uh, if, if you look at current policies in the different countries, uh, we will probably wind up somewhere around three degrees or so. Now, uh, you may wonder what does it mean, uh, two degrees, three degrees, to put this into perspective, uh, the temperature change uh, from an ice age to a warm period amounts to approximately four degrees, okay, four degrees. And uh, you can imagine that uh, these two climate states are radically different, okay, an ice age. Uh, and a warm phase. So we are living now in a warm phase and a warm period. You know, uh, these are really completely different climates. Uh, now, the major difference now is uh, the speed because uh, we uh, uh, may uh, realize uh, such a warming within, say, 100 years or so, while nature uh, takes 
many thousand years uh, to change its climate uh, by several degrees. We will do it uh, within uh, 100 years or so. And, and uh, uh, besides this, uh, if we would reach temperatures as high as projected uh, for uh, a scenario for a business case, uh, usual scenario, uh, then uh, the absolute level of temperature would be also unprecedented in, in man's history. Um, I, I think that the main point uh, and, and the take home message is that you can't negotiate with physics and you can't compromise with physics. And I think uh, uh, many decision makers have not really understood uh, this uh, fact. You can't negotiate with physics and you can't compromise with physics. Physics has its own laws. Uh, and if we do certain things, uh, the climate uh, warms uh, according to the physical laws. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, there is no way uh, uh, that, we, uh, uh, that, that we act and uh, that we act uh, very quickly. Uh, let me take you back um, into the year 1896. 1896, let me see if I can. Yeah, uh, 1896. Um, uh, this was the year when the first scientific paper uh, was published uh, on the issue of global warming. It was published uh, by... Uh, uh, Swedish uh, physicist Svante Arrhenius, and uh, Svante Arrhenius uh, was one of, of the great scientists at that time. He received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1903, and he published a, a paper, I have written the title here, on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground, okay, upon the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. So carbonic acid, what he meant uh, was uh, carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide um, is uh, the gas that, uh, uh, mostly is, that mostly is responsible uh, for the global warming. And he did uh, many uh, calculations. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I have uh, copied this here from uh, his uh, 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 seminal paper. So you're not supposed to read these numbers. Uh, all what I want to say is that he did uh, many, many calculations, but he had basically one problem and we face the same problem today. He, he, he couldn't know how mankind will behave. And so what did he do? And this is what we also do today. He calculated uh, different scenarios. Okay, so he assumed, for instance, and these are the numbers uh, on the very left, uh, he uh, assumed, for instance, uh, a situation uh, where the greenhouse gases would uh, reduce in, in the atmosphere by 30%, okay, and you, maybe you can see it, you see many minor signs here, okay, he, he did calculations for the different latitude belts, for the different seasons, and so on, I mean, this is incredible what, what, what he did, and remember, this was 1896, you know, there were no satellites, there was no computer whatsoever, um, and, and so he calculated that it would become uh, uh, significantly cooler on, on the planet. And, and uh, uh, he actually discovered uh, one important uh, factor that contributes to the development of ice ages, nam namely the reduction of greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere, such as CO2. And then he also calculated what would happen if the uh, carbon dioxide concentration would increase uh, in the atmosphere and here in this red uh, box um, uh, he uh, actually calculated what would happen uh, if uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would double and if you can see it you know he calculated something like five degrees or so in, in, on, in, in the global average and as I mentioned, uh, this is approximately the temperature change uh, between ice age and uh, 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 warm phase. And his calculations, uh, you know, maybe they have been a little bit on the high side, uh, but in principle, 
uh, that they are still uh, valid. There are uh, computer models which would actually uh, uh, predict uh, such such an amount of warming. So the best estimate uh, today, if you average over all models, somewhere between three or four uh, degrees. So in principle, I think what I'm trying to tell you is we don't have a knowledge problem. Uh, you know, because this person here, Svanterinius, he did basically everything uh, more than 100 years ago. So we have an implementation problem. So that's really uh, the issue. Now, a friend of Svanterinius, another Nobel Prize uh, winner, Wilhelm Oswald, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1909. Uh, he made this um, uh, uh, important statement. And, and once again, I mean, this is more than 100 years ago. So he said, uh, we are just about to live off an unexpected inheritance that we have found in the form of fossil fuels under the earth. This material will be used up. And the main point here is permanent economy is possible only through the ongoing energy supply of the sun. Okay, and uh, we haven't really listened uh, to him. Uh, so uh, this is a book uh, uh, which is in German. I don't know if it has been translated in English or, or not, which was published in uh, 1912. So then uh, to go on, uh, th there was a kind of wake up call uh, by the Club of Rome. So the, the Club of Rome uh, published uh, a report in 1972, limits to growth. And, and Wahid has basically, uh, at least implicitly, alluded uh, to, to this work. And uh, as the title of the report says, limits to growth, uh, uh, we, we can't uh, always take more from the planet than the planet can sustain in, 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 uh, reproduce in a sustainable manner. Okay, and I have uh, copied here one statement, uh, which is at the end of this report. And uh, it reads, if the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. Okay, so this was in 1972, sometimes uh, within the next 100 years. So in this uh, century, the most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. And we haven't really learned anything uh, for, from that. So we are still following the worst case pass uh, that uh, the Club of Rome uh, calculated. And it's really time uh, to turn around and to uh, leave this pass uh, as quickly as possible. Now let's get to the climate change uh, problem. Uh, as I said, uh, it's basically uh, about global warming, and I mentioned already carbon dioxide, <coughs> too. and carbon dioxide largely gets into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels. So, uh, uh, you know, the blood of a, our economy is energy, energy must be produced, and we burn coal, we burn oil, and we burn natural gas. These are the fossil fuels, and whenever uh, we burn it, we burn those uh, 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 materials, then uh, carbon dioxide uh, is emitted. And uh, we have reached already uh, a concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, which is unprecedented in humans' history. So what we see here in this blue curve is the CO2 concentration, so the CO2 content of the atmosphere for the last 800,000 years. So we are going back almost 1 million years here. And you may wonder, how does this person know how the CO2 concentration has been? Uh, uh, say 600,000 years ago or, or so. That's relatively simple because uh, you see on this picture here, uh, which is taken from Antarctica, some of my colleagues and they drill in the ice. Okay, and then they get these ice cores and uh, in these ice cores, there uh, are uh, uh, little ice bubbles, uh, which they can analyze. These ice bubbles conserve uh, the, the composition of, of the air, and you can, of course, date them, and therefore this is a hard fact here, okay, so we can reconstruct the CO2 concentration of 
the atmosphere, you see it, it varied also uh, uh, with ice ages and warm phases. Here is the last ice age. 20,000 years ago, so the height of the last ice age, you see carbon dioxide was relatively uh, low. But uh, since uh, the start of the end of uh, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration uh, has reached levels uh, that we uh, didn't have uh, at least for the, three, uh, for the last three million years ago. Okay, so today uh, uh, we are almost close to 420 units. Okay, and you see the limit here uh, for warm phases uh, have been yeah just under 300 units or so. Uh, okay, so we are ready way out uh, of uh, the natural bounds. Okay, the problem, of course, is that uh, we have no sense for this. So uh, we can't see carbon dioxide. It's a gas. It's invisible. Okay, and if this would happen, right? So here, if, if uh, the sky would will, will, will turn brownish, right? Or if it would stink, uh, I, I think we would have uh, uh, taken action already, but exactly this is not happening. So the whole problem remains abstract in some way. Okay, and uh, therefore I, I think we don't take it uh, as seriously as possible. Now we can also from these uh, uh, ice cores uh, reconstruct uh, the temperature in Antarctica. Okay, and you can see that there is a clear relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide concentration. So here during the last ice age, carbon dioxide was low and temperature was low as well. So once again, we don't uh, have a knowledge problem here. And the whole thing has to do with the so-called greenhouse effect. Uh, because the Earth is habitable, because we, we have uh, a greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect means that uh, our atmosphere is mostly transparent for the solar radiation. Okay, however, the heat uh, cannot really escape to space. Okay, because the atmosphere is not very transparent uh, for infrared radiation. Okay, and therefore heat is is somehow trapped in the uh, near the surface, and, and therefore uh, our uh, planet uh, is so mild on its surface, okay? It can go completely wrong, uh, wrong as on Venus. On Venus, we have a giant greenhouse effect, okay? And we have temperatures in excess of 400 degrees Celsius on the surface. But if you have understood this, then I think we, we understand the global warming problem uh, because uh, as we uh, uh, increase the content of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we enhance the greenhouse effect, okay, and this must lead to global warming. Yeah, and uh, global warming is happening. Uh, we can see this here. So we have uh, two curves here. One is the carbon dioxide concentration. So this yellow curve here, we see as it uh, increases with time and this bluish, the, the light blue curve here is the temperature of the planet. And uh, it, it's uh, a little bit irregular because there are also natural climate fluctuations. But if you look at the whole record, you can't miss uh, the relationship uh, between increase in carbon dioxide and increase in surface temperature of the planet. Now, if the planet warms, uh, there must uh, be more frequent heat waves, okay? And I would like to explain this uh, by these so-called distributions. So these are statistical uh, distributions, okay? So if, if we look at this curve here, okay, so this represents, say, uh, uh, the normal climate, okay? Well, well, what is shown here is uh, the, the probability, okay? And here we have the temperature. And, and so the high point in this distribution is, is the, the mean temperature, the average temperature, okay? And then, so that's the most probable value, all right? And then as you go to the left, uh, here you have the cold extremes, okay? They are extremes because uh, uh, the probability uh, of occurrence is low, therefore they are on this side. So these are the cold extremes. And here on the other side, you have the warm extremes, okay? And now if uh, you warm the planet, um, then you just shift this distribution 
to the right, to the warmer temperatures here. And you see what happens. You lose uh, the cold extremes and uh, what has been a warm extreme or hot extremes becomes much more frequent and you also get new records, okay? Uh, and uh, this is exactly what's happening during the last decades, especially in here in Germany, where I live, but uh, on, on, on many places uh, on, 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 on this planet, exactly this is happening. Now I have some examples of, of uh, temperature records. So this was in, in June 2021. Okay, and so you may remember uh, the, the record temperatures, the record heat wave in Western Canada. And the city of Lytton uh, recorded 49.6 degrees, 49.6 degrees, almost 50 uh, degrees. So this was uh, the all time Canadian record. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, more and more heat waves in India and in and, and, and Pakistan. And uh, uh, one uh, scientific team calculated uh, the probability that the increase in probability uh, of the occurrence of heat waves. Okay, and, and they calculated uh, that nowadays uh, climate change or global warming uh, has made heat waves in India and Pakistan 30 times more likely, 30 times more likely. And uh, at this point, I should mention that we are always talking about probabilities. So this doesn't mean that we will have uh, uh, in, from now on every year uh, uh, a catastrophic heat wave, uh, okay? But uh, the, 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 uh, the likelihood of the occurrence uh, increases. Now, uh, this was in uh, uh, last year, in my May last year, okay, you see some readings here. Uh, so temperatures up to 50 degrees and, and in some cities, 51 degrees. Uh, okay, so uh, these have been all time uh, temperatures. And, and I mean, it's not just climate, it's, it, it's about, uh, 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 I, I mean, think about people who have uh, to work uh, under these uh, conditions. I mean, there have been so many uh, 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 dead uh, people in, in response to, to the heat wave. Uh, it affects agriculture. I mean, it affects almost everything. And, and uh, I have uh, written in, in again and again in, in my books that some parts of uh, the earth will become inhabitable, okay, if we allow temperatures uh, to continue uh, to increase. Uh, uh, let me go on. Oops. Yeah, so that's one side of the coin, okay? But global warming has another side, and, and this is heavy precipitation, which uh, cause, causes flooding. So we had a terrible uh, uh, flood uh, in, in 2021. Uh, in, 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 in Germany and also partly in the Netherlands and in Belgium and, and Luxembourg. Uh, and uh, uh, our models uh, uh, already very early uh, predicted uh, that heavy pre precipitation events uh, will increase in, in frequencies. And what we see here are also uh, uh, distributions, okay? So if, if you look at a normal distribution, so they look different than the temperature distributions, then you see that the highest probability is for light rains or even for no rain, okay? And then on the other side, you have the heavy, heavy precipitation events, but they are rare events, okay? They don't occur very often. Now, what happens uh, if the temperature warms? You see here uh, by the arrows, on, on the one hand, uh, the probability for fewer uh, light precipitation events decreases, but on the same at the same time, the probability of heavy precipitation events increases. Okay, and this is exactly what we observe in many regions of the planet uh, that these heavy precipitation events increase. And uh, uh, we we had the sad event in in in, in Pakistan. Uh, these uh, pouring rains uh, for, for, for weeks and, and weeks, and uh, one third of the country uh, was un underwater, uh, more than 1,700 dead people, and, and uh, 
the country is still trying to recover in in, in some way uh, from uh, these uh, floods. And uh, I, I think we need to realize, uh, not us, I suppose, but the world has to realize uh, that there are limits to adaptation and of course, uh, uh, financial viability. And, and uh, this basically goes back to the Club of Rome, okay? So if we don't limit global warming, we will wind up in a disaster, okay? And uh, the living conditions uh, on, on this planet uh, will, will uh, uh, drastically worsen. Now, and then there is another impact, uh, uh, which is sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise is, is reality. So if you see here the satellite measurements, uh, we have satellite measurements uh, uh, since 1993. Okay, so we see here the scale in, in, in centimeter and you see uh, how uh, the sea level, so that's a globally averaged uh, sea level is, is rising. And uh, since the start of the, uh, uh, satellite measurements in 1993, uh, we had already an increase of 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters uh, within 30 years. Okay, so that's a lot and it's already threatening many million people uh, in coastal areas. Now, sea level rise is not uniform. Uh, it has a regional variation, as you can see here. So in some regions, uh, as uh, you can see here, for instance, or Greenland, sea level rise is, is uh, relatively small. In some regions, uh, like here in the Antarctica, you have even falling sea levels. Uh, but in the global average, as you can see by the yellow and the red, and orange color, uh, sea level is rising. If we look here, uh, India, Pakistan, and so on, we are somewhere here uh, on, on the scale. So say up to five centimeter, uh, five millimeter uh, per year, uh, but uh, sea level rise will accelerate, okay? And if you look here in the Western Pacific, for instance, where we have the, the uh, uh, low islands, all, all right, then you see uh, we have, uh, uh, even stronger sea level rises. And um, uh, this is something which may really become a disaster because sea level responds very, very slowly. Okay, so here in this uh, little uh, inlet, uh, you see how sea level may uh, evolve by the end of the century, by 2100, okay? And if you look at the scale, we are talking about maybe a meter or so. However, if you look at the large picture, okay, which extends to 2300, then you see we are no longer talking about one meter. We are talking uh, uh, about several meters. And in the worst case, it can be even be more than five meters of, of sea level rise. And even in the best of all worlds, so if we were basically would um, uh, uh, limit global warming to say 1.5 degrees or so, sea level would still continue uh, to rise. Uh, but you see the difference here. So it's worse uh, uh, acting and not uh, allow global warming uh, uh, to, to continue uh, in uh, in, in, in the manner as, as it happened during the last decades. Now, climate uh, politics, Wahid has uh, told us already a little bit. Uh, here we see a picture from the uh, Paris Climate Conference in 2015. Okay, so uh, 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 politicians uh, basically congratulate themselves. I was always skeptical about this uh, agreement because there is nothing binding. Okay, so in principle, these are only words. And uh, so if, if you read it carefully, and if, if you want to read it, I, I mean, read the appendix, because everything that is important is written in the appendix. And uh, then you find sentences like, uh, we will try uh, to reach uh, uh, the, the height of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, 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 sometime uh, during this century or, or so. I, I, I mean, it's basically, uh, 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 yeah, it, the, the, it, it's wish, wishful thinking. Let me put it this way. It, it's wishful thinking. Now, and uh, why I'm saying this uh, is because uh, 
uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions are still increasing. As you can see here, since 1960, uh, there were little dips here. So this little dip here was Corona, okay? Uh, but now in 2022, uh, we are basically back uh, to pre-Corona -con uh, uh, con conditions. And, and we can't really see uh, that um, um, uh, climate protection is, is successful in, in any way. Now, let me explain to you why it's only this that matters, okay? Only the global emissions of carbon dioxide uh, is important for the climate. Why is this? Because carbon dioxide, the residence time of carbon dioxide uh, amounts to centuries to millennia, okay? So it simply doesn't go away. And uh, so, therefore, uh, uh, it, it is uh, uh, irrelevant where you emit carbon dioxide, because if you emit carbon dioxide and if the residence time uh, in the atmosphere is long enough, it's, it will distribute um, and uh, therefore it will be uh, effective uh, everywhere. And the best example that this is true is the polar regions, okay? So why is the Arctic melting away? Uh, although almost, uh, al although there was hardly any CO two emissions uh, in, in in the Arctic, okay. So uh, uh, and 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 this is really the the grand challenge. I, I mean, all countries need to act together, and uh, 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 so we need international cooperation. But what we observe is uh, the opposite. Okay, we we have less and less international cooperation. And uh, if, if this remains the case, we won't uh, solve any of the grand challenges uh, that mankind is facing. Now, how will temperature evolve until 2100? We see here the different uh, scenarios. So in, in principle, uh, so theoretically, you can limit uh, global warming uh, to well below two, two degrees if you want. But uh, as I mentioned uh, before, we are somewhere here on this path. So we are on, on track uh, of uh, yeah realizing three degrees or, or so. And, and I mentioned already, this would be really a disaster. It could be even more uh, depending on the scenario that we uh, assume. Now in Pakistan, uh, 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 you see the warming here uh, during the last decades, okay, so we have uh, a warming of uh, 1.2 degrees, so it's approximately in the range of the global average, and uh, yeah, we are also heading uh, in Pakistan uh, for three, maybe 3.5 degrees in, in uh, 2100, uh, and uh, if you look at the green curve, um, uh, then you see this probably the best we can achieve, but still uh, uh, it will be well above uh, two degrees. So if you read, okay, so that would be a quick decline of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, would be zero uh, by 2080. I, I'm convinced that it uh, is possible earlier, okay, but what is missing is the political will. And uh, yeah, we have to work on this. I mean, solutions exist. It, it's not a matter that we don't know uh, how, to, how to cope with the global warming problem, okay? I, I mean, we don't have an energy problem on this planet. Uh, we have solar energy, uh, 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 almost an infinite amount of solar energy. We have wind power. We can use uh, uh, maybe also some uh, uh, bio power. But once again, uh, it's possible. And uh, I, I mean, uh, money is not a problem. Uh, we see it that uh, during wars, you know, billions and billions of euros are available from one day to the other. So, I, I mean, money is there. There is plenty of money. So we have the technology and we have the money. But as I said, the political will is missing. And here are some examples. So this is an, a hydrogen uh, train in, in, in Lower Saxony here in Germany. Uh, this is a container. Uh, a ship which uh, works with the fuel cell, uh, Airbus, Airbus, the, the uh, 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 airplane uh, manufacturer announced now that uh, they will produce the first oxygen, uh, hydrogen uh, driven uh, airplane by 2030. 
All right. And uh, yeah, so we have everything uh, at our hands to limit global warming. And the only question, and I would like to stop uh, with uh, these two animations, the, the only question that remains is which world do we want? Do we want a world with climate protection or do we want a world without climate protection and you see the two options okay on the left you see uh the best of all worlds where we really limit global warming to somewhere uh near 1.5 uh, degrees and uh, the right planet is the one uh if greenhouse gas emissions uh, continue to rise more or less unabatedly and uh, yeah, I, I think that the colors already tell the story. Uh, the right planet uh, turns uh, uh, deep, uh, deeply red. Okay, uh, if, if you look here in some regions uh, uh, where you have the dark red, okay, you are talking about temperature changes, increases of five to six degrees or so. And, and remember, I, I mean, uh, uh, I live in Germany, Wahid, I think you live in, in the Netherlands or, or so. Uh, I mean, uh, if you assume that our temperatures will increase by another three degrees or so, in Germany, uh, we had uh, uh, the last all-time record in 2019 with 41.2 degrees, 41.2 uh, degrees. In Hamburg, where, where, where I mostly live, uh, we had 40 degrees, 40.1 last year. So the absolute temperature record uh, for Hamburg. And now add a few degrees. Okay. I, I mean, even in Europe, uh, conditions uh, uh, will become extremely uh, uh, serious. And uh, people forget that uh, uh, this also affects them in, in, in various ways. So the last word is given to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, also Nobel Prize winner. And he said uh, something uh, really great. And I would like to share this with you. We cannot solve our significant problems from the same level of thinking we were at when we created these problems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow, amazing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mujib. Uh, very informative. Uh, yeah, Amsterdam and Karachi have one thing in common that both are below sea level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. So, uh, Rana Sab, should we start the open question and answer session? Yes, please. Um, yeah, okay, please. Everybody, uh, uh, yeah, it is oh, open see. Uh, forum and uh, you can uh, even give your opinion here. You can share uh, concerns uh, and also ask questions, uh, but uh, one by one, uh, just raise the hand. There is an uh, icon I want to just to want to welcome Tyra Abdullaji as well. I see she, she's there and Dharamveer who has been educating us quite a lot on environmental uh, issues. So. I see yes. a lot more people have joined us. Thank you. Yeah, so let me uh, take uh, first question by Rais Sarim. Uh, Rais Sarim, uh, please unmute yourself and ask question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, it is fantastic uh, and uh, uh, enlightening what to the knowledge, uh, to have knowledge about the miseries. Uh, the, uh, climate warming is uh, spreading all over the world. Uh, I have one question. Uh, we have heard about uh, a special trade uh, selling and buying uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide bonds. And uh, they say uh, with, with this trade, uh, there would be uh, an improvement of living standard. Number two, there, there would be a promotion of biodiversity. Number three, uh, there would be a provision of biological uh, uh, resources. Uh, do you think it's correct in this way? 
Well, uh, the, the whole uh, methodology uh, is uh, uh, emission trading, or it's called emission trading. And uh, it's about uh, trading, but also about capping, okay? It only works uh, if you continuously uh, uh, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that is allowed to be emitted. Okay, therefore it's it's trade and cap. Okay, so that this is how they call it, and uh, in in principle it it works. It it works in in Europe. Uh, so carbon dioxide uh, emissions went down. Okay, but uh, it ultimately depends on how quickly you reduce the allowed emissions. Okay. And uh, then actually it could have uh, beneficial effects. But as I uh, um, pointed out, uh, uh, it, it, it must work everywhere. I mean, it's not enough if it only works in Europe or in, in a few other areas, okay? It's a global problem. And, and this is really uh, the dilemma we are in. Uh, uh, all countries must act together. And uh, of course, uh, there are smaller countries and, and larger countries, there are smaller emitters and larger emitters. And uh, if I look at the current uh, uh, ranking of the emitters, then China contributes to approximately 30% of the world's emissions, the US approximately 15%. So th these are two countries which uh, contribute almost half of the global CO2 emissions. So what I'm, and, and both don't have an uh, uh, emission trading system, okay? And we have to find ways, and, and this is what I pointed out, uh, of international cooperation, okay? Without international cooperation, uh, uh, we simply can't solve the problem. But in principle, I, I mean, we have to accept, you know, the world as it is. And I think, uh, 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 giving a price to CO2 emissions is the right way, okay? But the question is, of course, uh, how high uh, is the price and uh, 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 will it really, will the price, re if it's high enough, I'm, I'm pretty sure, but uh, will the price uh, really reduce carbon dioxide emissions? I can say, from the perspective of Germany, it already helped uh, to phase out coal, okay? Because uh, burning coal uh, and, and, uh, is, is now so expensive, okay, that uh, it's uh, better to invest uh, into renewable energies because renewable energies in the end is the cheapest way of producing energy. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, any other participants want to ask question? Yeah. Moment of silence. I think we are still uh, 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 impacted. Than... Yeah, still impacted by the you know, horrific uh, presentation by Dr. Mujib that uh, honestly speaking, uh, it uh, gave us goosebump uh, what is happening with our uh, generations in future. Yeah, Solomon, please. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, sir. Uh, and it was, uh, I'm really delighted to hear what you have said. It is like just an eye, eye opening for me. But just going like what you say, the, like to the contributors that is China and America, I think, um, and you talk about political, like less political will or no political will. Uh, but I must say like this region, India and China, um, and also if you like include Pakistan, we are already around 40% contributor of CO2 emission. If you like just uh, add China 30% and eight, nine percent of, of, of India. And isn't it hard or like uh, to, to, you know, uh, capacitate these two countries, which are already on the rivalry of like uh, putting more industrialization in their countries um, and yeah, how it will dent the impact, which we really want to see in coming up years, how to tackle these two like giants where we already have got around 
around 30 to 40 percent of the of the inhabitants of of the world of the globe how do you see this this thing impacting China, uh, climate change in future thank you well <laughs> this is the ultimate question right uh, it, it's uh, very hard so theoretically uh it it's uh, easy because it, it, in principle uh, you should have a trading system where uh or, or le let me give you one, one more uh, piece of information uh, to, to to understand uh, better what what I, I would like to say so I, I mean if you consider the present global warming okay this is not the result of the current emissions okay the current warming the present warming is the result of the historical emissions of the uh, cumulative historical emissions okay and countries like the us uh, but also germany uh, emit uh, uh, for a long time uh, carbon dioxide so therefore most of the historical responsibility is with the industrialized countries okay so that's number one therefore uh, I think uh, one way of coping with this problem would be uh, that the industrialized countries buy shares uh, from the developing countries, okay? And then uh, this money is then used for the sustainable development of the uh, uh, developing countries, okay? So that would be a fair trade, right? But you can imagine if you talk uh, to America, okay, uh, giving money to other countries, uh, uh, they they won't accept it. At least today, they they won't accept it, and and that, that's the problem. You know, once money gets involved, uh, then uh, nobody wants uh, uh, to 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 pay. But that's this is really the the only way I see uh, how. Uh, the climate change problem can be tackled uh, in a fair uh, manner. And once again, I mean, it's not a matter of technology. The technology is there and, and the uh, finances are all, also there. Uh, it's just, as I said, a, a matter of the political will and whether or not those countries who are really responsible uh, uh, take the lead and... and, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, take on their responsibility and, and uh, give a little bit uh, away uh, from their welfare, okay? I mean, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, uh, those countries won't live any longer in wealth or so. I mean, it's just a little piece that they have to give up, to give up and, and give it to the developing countries. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Tyra Ji, please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Latif Sahab. What a superb presentation that was. My Mubarakbad and, and kudos. Uh, my question is already in the chat box. I don't know whether you can see it. But uh, basically, it, uh, I am very disappointed and upset that at COP27, we saw the world heading towards consensus and unanimity. But there were just two or three countries which are very serious emitters that they held the rest of the world hostage. And then we saw uh, awful compromises and awful watering down of the final documents and declarations coming out of COP27. So the question is, how can we eliminate or go around or get rid of such an unacceptable veto power and that leads to all this compromise and watering down? Thank you. Well, I, I mean, uh, conferences uh, that are uh, uh, or United Nations conferences like the climate conferences, uh, the, the, the COPs, uh, they depend on that uh, every country agrees to the uh, final document. Okay, I, I mean, the, the, if there is only one country 
uh, who who is uh, uh, not satisfied with the document, uh, then there won't be a document. So that's the, the problem with United Na Nations uh, conferences. And therefore, I think uh, we can't wait uh, for, uh, for every country. So we should just go ahead. Those countries who would like to do something, they should go ahead. And um, I call it the alliance of the willing. And uh, I, I mean, they should press on. Uh, so I, I hope uh, uh, that you know, Europe would be part of, of this alliance, uh, the United States would be part of the alliance, maybe Australia after the change of, of government and, and, and many other countries, and uh, then just do it, okay? And, and uh, uh, yeah, they, they develop uh, in, uh, renewable energies uh, much faster uh, uh, and, uh, and, and show the rest of the world uh, that, uh, yeah, in, in the end, you have an economic uh, advantage. I mean, that, that's the point. How can you convince other countries? And, and I, I think you, you, you must come to a point uh, where uh, it, it's no longer profitable to burn fossil fuels. And those countries like Germany, like uh, uh, other European countries, like the Scandinavian countries, uh, US, I, I mean, uh, the, the uh, President Biden has now uh, launched a huge program to, to support renewable energies, to support the transition of the economy. Uh, okay, 400 billion US dollars. I mean, that's the way to, to, to go. You can't wait for every country, just go ahead, however, I mean, and, and this is uh, especially uh, concerning China. I mean, if a country like China don't want to be part of this club, of this alliance, uh, then you must rethink the way you uh, deal economically with China. I mean, uh, uh, economy is important, okay, but environment is more important, all right? And I mean, you can't make every deal with China uh, if it is a dirty deal, dirty in, in the sense uh, that it happens at the expense of the emissions of greenhouse gases, okay? Because China burns a lot of coal, okay? And coal produces most uh, CO2 per energy unit um, uh, and, and almost uh, twice as much as if, if you burn uh, natural gas, uh, for instance. And, and so I, I think uh, if there is this alliance, okay, the alliance of the willing, they should also put pressure on those countries who won't, who don't want to become a uh, member of the uh, alliance. And then I hope uh, that things will work uh, out in the end. But, you know, uh, maybe there's also wishful thinking. Uh, yes, Tayyip, uh, can you please? Unmute yourself and then ask this. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Latif. And uh, I heard uh, you so many times on German videos and uh, your um, your contribution is very high uh, regarding international cooperation. Now, first thing is uh, your wishful thinking was nice. Interne how, how to convince China or India or other countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, all of them, and uh, give them the money or China has got the money. Uh, China should give the money to these people, to these countries. And the other question, the other thing is, there's a conspiracy theory as well, which, is, which says this uh, global warming is a hoax. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I see what, what, what you're trying to say. And uh, uh, and I, I get uh, emails every day uh, okay, claiming that uh, global warming is not real and only in the heads uh, or in the, in the brains of, of uh, uh, some scientists. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, what, what, what can we do? I, uh, 
the world has changed, okay? The media has changed, okay? So we have now social media and, and so on. We have the internet. And so you can basically put everything online, all right? And, and this confuses people. However, I, I mean, uh, as I, I, I hope I could convince you, uh, I, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the science of global warming is so old, okay? So I, I showed the work by Svante Renius from uh, year 1896, okay? So more than 100 years ago. And, and you know, uh, the climate was okay at that time. And in principle, he predicted what would happen, okay? So he didn't know. Uh, how we will behave. But he said, you know, if greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere, uh, the earth will warm. And exactly this happened. I mean, uh, if you want a proof, uh, what kind of proof do you really want? I mean, uh, this is more th than a proof. And then the computer simulations uh, that, for instance, my, my, my thesis supervisor, Klaus Hasselmann, did. Uh, you know, uh, more than 30 years ago, they turned out to be uh, correct, okay? So the, the planet exactly evolved in, in, in that manner. But let, let me uh, give you uh, another perspective on, on, on this. We are scientists and science is inherently uncertain, okay? So there is no absolute truth in science. And I was thinking uh, about the skeptics arguments, okay? So there is no real uh, global warming and this is fake. And uh, maybe if there is global warming, uh, this is the sun or whatever, okay? But it's not us. And I was thinking about it. And uh, I think the only way you can show that humans, are responsible for the global warming is if you would have a time machine and you go back in time with the time machine to pre-industrial times and then you start over the evolution of the climate okay without emitting greenhouse gases and so on and then you would have a second evolution and then you can compare uh, the two evolutions, okay, and then you can quantify exactly what the contribution uh, of mankind is to global warming. However, I don't have a time machine. I'm afraid that you don't have a time machine either. So what is the second best possibility? You do this experiment with computer models. I mean, computer models are standard in, in industry. You create a car on the computer. You create an airplane on the computer. Okay, you do everything on the computer, all right? And so uh, with computer programs, you can basically uh, create a digital twin of the Earth. And then you can do the experiment. And this is exactly what we did. Not I, myself, but my, my doctoral supervisor, Klaus Hasselmann, okay? And uh, also people in the US who were also awarded the Nobel Prize. And then you see, you simply can't explain the global warming without including human activities in the form of greenhouse gas emissions, okay? And so, I mean, uh, to the extent that there is something like a proof in science, this proof has been delivered more than 30 years ago. Yeah, just um, in reaction on that, uh, I am convinced, you know, and, and, and you have convinced us all, but why China, or I'm not saying China, China, but I'm saying there are other countries like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, you know, all of these countries, yeah. They don't give a, in English, we say they don't give a shit, you know. So why? Why they are doing that? Why, especially China? Because yeah. they have oh, Okay. They have yeah. 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 Because uh, uh, those countries uh, would like uh, to further develop. And in China, I, I don't know exactly. So first of all, I mean, I have been several times in China. And I talked to my Chinese colleagues and so on. So the, they agree on the climate change problem. So that's that's not the point. 
Okay. However, they say, hey, we have not, uh, uh, we are not responsible in the first place for the climate change problem, and and therefore, why should we act uh, if others have basically created uh, the the problem? So that's the the argument, and and. I, I mean, I, I can understand this argument to some extent, but it, it doesn't help. I mean, because uh, if we destroy the planet, uh, uh, every country will suffer, okay? Uh, China, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, everyone. And and so I, I can somehow understand the argument, but uh, I, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, how can I say? In, in a way, it's not an argument, uh, because uh, you pull away the rug on 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 on, uh, on, on, on which you stand, okay? And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, this is diplomacy. And uh, uh, diplomacy obviously doesn't seem to work, and, and uh, it may be also too slow. And therefore, I think it has to be solved economically. So, and therefore... I, I'm very much in favor of this uh, uh, coalition of, of the willing or the alliance uh, of, of the willing and, and try to put some economical pressure on those countries who refuse uh, to take action. But on the other hand, also help them, right? I, I mean, uh, as, as I mentioned, there must be kind of fair deal between uh, the different countries. Yes, Rizvi. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> actually, it, it, it's a furtherance of the question was Tahir Abdullah ji raised uh, already. Uh, I'm wondering all the time, who are these people who, who are participating by all these cops uh, besides uh, some honorable and learned persons like you, sir, uh, especially those who are representing the uh, different governments, uh, different countries, uh, are they uh, uh, actually uh, enough competent to do, have the knowledge uh, what's going on? Uh, or uh, they are uh, participating only just to plead the political uh, ambitions of, the, of, of their governments? Well, I, I talk to many politicians, and I, I mean that, that they do have the knowledge. So that's not the problem. They do have the knowledge, uh, but they are unable uh, to act for for many reasons. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, I, I mean, if 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 you talk about the cops, I mean there are I don't know twenty thousand, thirty thousand people or so. Uh, so most of them are lobbyists. Okay, so they, they are not representatives of the governments, they are lobbyists, okay, and, and they, for some reason, I never understood it, why it is, uh, but for some reason, they are able to put so, so much pressure on the uh, politicians, okay, uh, that the politicians don't have the courage uh, to act. And uh, I, I think this is a big problem. It may also have to do with corruption, uh, okay, so because many po politicians, uh, um, after ending their political career, right, they, they switch uh, to uh, companies, energy companies, and 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 so on. Uh, so um, I, I think this also needs to be discussed, and that's not only the case in the U.S. It's also the case in Germany, for instance. Okay, and in many countries that uh, you know, I, I think the the. Uh, energy uh, companies and, and, and politics are often uh, too close, okay, and, and therefore um, um, the overall uh, uh, picture is, is somehow lost. And I, I think uh, uh, you also mentioned this, Wahid, in, in your introduct in introductory uh, statement. I, I think what it basically comes down to is we, we need another a mode in which the economy, the world economy functions. Okay, so I, I think this, this is uh, at the heart of, of the problem, because as you said, uh, you, you quoted Milton Friedman. Oh, okay, yeah. uh, I mean, if it's the only value, okay, to maximize the profit, uh, things must go wrong and, and things are going wrong. 
Yeah, uh, if you allow me to add uh, something to also to in response to Tayyip's question, I think it's it's firstly it is not that black and white that uh, that China, Indonesia, Pakistan give a toss about uh, about environment, and on the other hand, uh, some Western countries they are really doing a terrific job, fantastic, very committed. It's not that black and white. I think those countries, if you if you start from the industrial revolution i mean these developed so-called developed countries have a couple of hundred years uh, ahead of uh, uh, polluting the the world and somewhere and and i agree with the uh, mujib sahab those countries have a case i mean uh, we don't agree with them uh, but there is a case that you polluted the world for 200 years you looted us and did everything you could uh, made uh, trillions and trillions of dollars. Now, when we are, it's our turn to catch up, you put these restrictions on us. So give us not 200 years, give us 20 years. So uh, you, you might end up having some sympathy with that kind of argument. Okay, that's not an argument. But on the other hand, also, if you look at the evolution and why I mentioned the Milton Friedman and neoliberalism, if you look at the development of last 30, 40 years, all the production, which creates actually a lot of emission, has been moved to these countries, again, to make more money and make profits at the expense of the environment and, and exploitation of the labor in those countries. So it's, as, as Dr. Mujib saying, that things are quite complex. Like, and I think if my memory is correct, at the last elections in the US, some $14 billion of advertising was done, just advertising. Now, where does this money come from? A lot of comes from all these polluters, actually, who support these parties. And all these people coming from Monsanto's and, uh, and, and banks and so on and so forth, uh, IMF, World Bank, they join the government or you leave the government and join these companies. So this is what the, the, the complexity is in this whole thing. So that's, I, that's the aspect I just wanted to add to it. Yeah, you, you made one one good point, and I, I would like to to re reinforce that point. It, it's not such that nothing is happening, okay? And if I uh, uh, may use Germany as an example, I mean Germany developed the renewable energies, okay? And uh, this is the reason why there is such an increase in the use of renewable energies all around the world, uh, okay? And uh, but what we must succeed is uh, um, that in, in, in principle, renewable energy is, is cheap. OK, and if I think about uh, countries uh, like India uh, uh, or other countries, I, I mean, using renewables in, 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 in a big country like uh, uh, India, uh, I think, would make much more sense uh, yep. than having a centralized uh, energy system. Uh, okay, and this is what I mean. I mean, we should, we as industrialized countries should enable those countries, right, to implement uh, these uh, 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 energy technologies. And then, I, I mean, nobody is against climate protection, especially the people are not against climate protection, okay? And, and uh, this is the way I think uh, the industrialized world should uh, 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 support uh, the uh, developing countries. And China is a special case, frankly. I mean, also the, the renewable energies uh, also boom in China, uh, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, this is outperformed by coal, right? Mm. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that's the, the problem. So taking the opportunity, uh, uh, Dr. Majib, uh, I need to ask three questions, uh, one by one, uh, the small questions. Number one, what uh, is the other contribution greenhouse uh, gases uh, except uh, CO2? Uh, like uh, uh, nitrogen and otherwise, because uh, you can see here in Europe, especially in Netherlands as well, that uh, the farmers are, um, yeah, um, they are protesting against the government. And uh, uh, many farmers have earlier and now also have been migrated to other countries like Canada and Australia otherwise. Second question is uh, uh, related to uh, the, you know, the uh, the proportion of uh, emissions 
between the production units and the products itself, you know, consume, uh, consumers products. So is there any uh, uh, proportion uh, has already been measured or not? Uh, and the third question is related to the activism that uh, uh, we have seen here uh, since uh, yeah uh, four or five years that there are a lot of young people they are coming out and uh, they are speaking uh, um, against the uh, states against the uh, polit politicians as well and they are also raising uh, a lot of um, uh, awareness among the population so uh, what is their contribution uh, at this moment, do you, do you think, is there any contribution that they have uh, already made an impact or they are increasing uh, their voices? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I, I mean, uh, the, your, your quest for, uh, first question uh, con concerned the other greenhouse gases. So, I, I mean, I, I limited uh, my talk today to come dioxide because it's this, uh, the, the most important uh, greenhouse gas that ap approximately contributes 60 uh, percent to, to the problem. Then we have methane. Methane is about just under 20 percent. Uh, okay, so these are the big two, right? Uh, the good thing about methane is that its residence time in the atmosphere is relatively short, on the order of 10 years. So if you would stop emitting methane, Okay, uh, the methane uh, concentration uh, would quickly uh, fall, okay, uh, in contrast to CO2, because CO2 has such a long residence time, it will be with us uh, for many hundreds of years, even for millennia, okay? So that's one uh, second question. I'm not quite sure if I understood the second question. I, I mean, uh, we, we are getting more and more efficient. So uh, per uh, uh, economical unit, we produce less and less CO2, OK? Uh, however, uh, it is uh, outweighted uh, mm -hmm. by uh, the more uh, of, of consumption, uh, okay? So that there is something that we call the rebound effect, okay? So you make a, a car more efficient, okay? It uses less gas, okay? But then the cars become bigger or more people uh, have cars, okay? In the end, you produce more CO2 <laughs> than uh, uh, before, uh, okay? Uh, and then the third, uh, yes, I, I mean, the, the, the activists had quite some impact, at least in Germany, I must say. So since Greta Thunberg uh, and Fridays for Future uh, 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 appeared on the scene, there was a tremendous change uh, in politics in, in Germany. Uh, so, and, and you can measure it uh, by the federal elections. So if you take uh, the election before the last, climate uh, was not on the agenda, uh, okay? I, I mean, it, it was not a topic uh, in, in, in the campaigns of, of the different parties, okay? However, during the last or before the last election, okay, uh, every political party took up the climate change problem and, and, and put it in, into their programs and, and, and so on. So they it made uh, a difference, okay? And But I, I can't judge, uh, I, I, I know it's, it's working in Germany, but I can't judge how it is on a global scale, uh, okay? Uh, Doctor, what is in the context of uh, populism? Because we have seen here in Europe and other parts of the world as well, that populist uh, regimes are taking control. Uh, and uh, there is more uh, sympathy or uh, uh, you can engagement with these populists. Yeah. So if they come, especially if uh, uh, in the in the context uh, of Europe, especially, then what would uh, that contribution that has been just made by these in these years, uh, pressure pressurized by these activists uh, in the government? So what would happen then? This would be the end, <laughs> really, uh, because I mean, if, if you look at Trump, if you look at Bolsonaro, right, so I, I mean, they 
I don't know if they, they are serious, but or if they really think it, but uh, they don't believe in the climate problem. Okay, they just say it's uh, 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 a hoax in, in, in some way. Uh, and uh, in, in principle, what you're asking comes back uh, to the international cooperation. Okay, international cooperation is not possible with such persons. Okay, and therefore I think that we have to avoid that these persons uh, 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 become more important. And, and But this, at least is my take on it, uh, has also to do with the way the economy is functioning. Because the economy is functioning in such a way that the richer becomes become richer and the poor becomes poorer. Okay, and then, of course, I, I mean, uh, people are so... Uh, uh, disappointed I, I mean uh, in in the end they don't see any other possibility to to vote for people like Trump or, or bolsonaro okay so in principle this all uh, uh, is linked okay and and I, I totally agree with you Wahid I, I think uh, the most important issue is uh, to change the way the economy is functioning yep. and that would solve many other problems. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Ram Rambir Singh, can you please ask your question? Thank you very much. This is Ranbir Singh. I am living right now in America and I moved out of India in 80s. I mean, right in 1980 or so. And about six years I lived in, in Germany and now I'm in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in America. And if you see the physics of warming, of global warming, if it is getting warm at one place, it is getting colder at the other place. Yeah. So as, as in physics they say, the entropy is the same yeah, of the whole uh, this is a what you can find uh, uh, place where the energy doesn't change. The total energy in this whole system of Earth here is the same. So the bad weather at one place is getting to different weather another on the other place on the Earth here. So all that the this global warming is creating is just changing, moving all the regular what do you call weather patterns that we had it is no more there so that's the big thing and i happened to see a documentary cowspiracy where they were saying that the especially the all the animal husbandry and all the animals that we are sort of uh, living with especially the cows and all, yeah, where the agriculture, all the what do you call emissions that being major produ production of the animal husbandry that we are having all over the world. And could you just talk about that also, if it is possible? Yeah, first of all, I, I mean, um, if we talk about global warming, this concerns uh, the uh, Earth's surface and the lower atmosphere. Okay, so the yeah. uh, upper atmosphere, the stratosphere is cooling. All, all right, mm -hmm. so we have to be very specific uh, about what we mean. So global warming concerns only the lower part of the atmosphere and, and the Earth's uh, surface. Mm -hmm. A second point I would like to make is that most of the heat uh, that, that is trapped in the system uh, is actually taken up by the oceans. Okay, 90% of the heat is taken up by the oceans. And therefore, uh, the, the, the heat content of the oceans is a much better indicator of uh, the warming of the climate system. It, it doesn't have all these little fluctuations that we have in the global temperature. Okay, so it goes up, goes down, and so on. Uh, the, the ocean heat content just increases more or less monotonically. Now, uh, regarding the animals, this is basically contained in the methane part, 
Okay, so I, I mentioned that uh, carbon dioxide is, is the most important gas contributes approximately to 60%, uh, just under 20% is, is methane. And within these 20%, uh, there is uh, the production of methane by animals, uh, for instance, okay? Or also if you go rice, okay, uh, you, you, you uh, methane is, is, is emitted uh, from, from uh, those, those uh, fields where, where, which are underwater, right? Um, and uh, therefore, I, I mean, uh, of course, we have also to tackle this problem, uh, but uh, I, I mean, uh, we waste uh, so much. I, I mean, we waste food, okay? So in Germany, for instance, almost one third of the food that is produced is not eaten. Okay, I mean, and, and uh, if we talk uh, about uh, global warming, not only if we talk about global warming, but, but also about the loss of biodiversity and so on, <clears throat> has to do with waste. Okay, I, I mean, we use much more than we actually need. Okay, and uh, we, we could basically keep the same uh, standard of living uh, with much less resources. Okay, and, and therefore, I, I, I think there is enough that the planet provides to all human beings, okay? But there is this little group of people, okay? A little group of humans which take a much too large share, okay? And and uh, this must change in, in some way. Don't ask me how I can do this, okay? But, uh, I, I mean, you showed it, Wahid. I think you showed the, this chart, yeah. okay, where we saw the top 10% or also uh, uh, produced most of the greenhouse gases. Yes. Ji, uh, Rihani, sir. Please unmute yourself, Dharambi. Dharambi, sir, we cannot hear you. Okay, I think uh, he has issues with the uh, mic. So any other question by any part participant? So no more questions is, are coming. Why? Why is Dhar what's wrong with Dharamvir? Yeah, he can. He is yeah. connected, but uh, uh, yeah, he's I think connected. he has problem with his uh, mic. Oh, not okay. again. Okay. So, uh, wait, but he can can I ask you please uh, to go to the closing because uh, now uh, there okay. is okay. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, and I think in the meantime, if uh, Dharamvir connects, uh, we yeah, can then later we can yeah can uh, take his question. Yeah. Uh, is uh, is screen sharing on? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, uh, close it uh, or summarize uh, some of the things we have uh, discussed just now. Uh, what happened? Okay, let me think uh, my slides are a bit different in different order. I think we, uh, uh, Dr. Mujib also came back to it a few times uh, to, the, to the economic models. And I think that is probably the core and the key to, to making any kind of change. And here is a quote I would like to start the, the summary with this, which is from Naomi Klein's book printed on the, on the back cover of uh, the book, This Changes Everything. And she kind of summarizes by saying that forget everything you know about the climate change. It is not about carbon. It's, it's a lot, of course, we just heard. But what she said, it's not about carbon, it's about capitalism. The good news is that we can seize this crisis to transform our failed economic system and build something radically better. 
okay, we might not have the all the answers today, how we can make it radically better, but it provides us with a, with a great opportunity to reset things. Uh, another example I just wanted to share with you, uh, which was uh, one of the third largest pollutant in the world, at least statistically, is the food wastage. And this is an example that about a third of food production, which is 1.3 billion tons, is wasted or lost. And this is enough to th feed 3 billion people in the world. And food waste loss account for a third of greenhouse gas per annum. So if the food waste stage was a country, it would be contributing one third to the greenhouse uh, gases every year. And food waste is the third, yeah, as I said, that was in the US, a little over 50% of all the produce is thrown away because it's deemed to be too ugly to be sold to the consumers. So again, there comes this, this, this kind of uh, economic model and we can have so many examples of it uh, if we go to Africa and talk about how things are developing there. Kenneth Boulding says that anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. And I think uh, Dr. Mujib also said that in a, in a slightly different way, that uh, how to be able to feed so many people in a sustainable way the earth and the planet is limited. It is, it is not completely unlimited. So this is, this is really the challenge. And we cannot believe or expect that, uh, that we, can, we can go endlessly producing uh, these things. This something went wrong here. I had some other slides which are, yeah, no. I'm sorry, I'm just checking. Oh yeah, here it is somehow. Can you see this? Yes, sir. Ah, here it is. Yeah, this is this was my closing. I was writing it. So I think looking looking at the, the, the all the discussion and presentation and talk talk by Hello? Yes, sir, continue, please. Okay, so so we, we see that, I mean, although there are a lot of uh, bad news and a lot of things going uh, actually uh, in, in a negative direction, but we see a lot of pro progress being made in the sense that there is a lot of growing consciousness uh, there is increasing public pressure and also because of the prospects of newly highly profitable business models. And I have been really believing this and saying this for years that as soon as the big industries think that then they, they can make a lot of money and uh, uh, in, in cleaning up the environment, they will go for it. Uh, and now we see huge investments uh, and uh, Dr. Mujib also mentioned for, for 500 billion uh, dollars close to 500 billion uh, 400 uh, by 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 Joe Biden Japan has agreed to 140 billion Europe is talking about uh, the green deal industry so we uh, but the so we will see a lot of these subsidies and and money coming from the governments to 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 do something better to improve the situation but the danger here is that there is a possible emergence of new billionaires, like we saw in the in the technology revolution, that uh, suddenly you had lots of billionaires and rich, few rich became richer and uh, poorer became poorer. Uh, the same thing might happen here if we don't deal with it as a package. If we only focus on environment and not the economic side of it and the social and the political side of it, we will be building probably another disaster for next in over next 20 30 or 50 years when you have the difference between the richer and poor growing because this became such a lucrative business to make uh, unlimited amount of money that the multinationals went for it uh, and so therefore together with environment as a package it's important it's crucial to address poverty population growth distribution of wealth education, healthcare, job creation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think uh, we, we need to uh, look, at the, look at the wars as well. Uh, 
the wars are one of the very big pollutants, I think, though we don't talk much about it. And we didn't, somebody mentioned that, I think somebody mentioned that. Uh, but if I, I was reading a few things about the wars and now Ukrainian war going on, and Dr. Mujib also mentioned that uh, money is always there, but not for environment and not against the global warming, but for the wars. And when we talk about Ukraine, there is uh, there is no limit. And we see that it is so bad that the, the shells from the First World War uh, containing sulfur, mustard, and, and other toxic ammunition are still turning up in France and Belgium. I mean, I read that last year, 900 tons of unexploded bombs uh, and, and other munition uh, came up. And the farmers, when they were plowing their fields, they unearthed bombs, unexploded bombs, uh, barbed wires, bullets, and other weaponry. And the land is still poisoned by, by excessive amounts of uh, iron in the soil. Uh, we saw the, the, uh, the Ona, uh, it's, it's, I think it was the Ona air base in Japan, which was uh, uh, evacuated by the US forces. And there are so much quantity of cadmium, of mercury, lead, and arsenic uh, in that area. And all these pollutants uh, with with heavy toxic load uh, for human and and wildlife, and they have very. We we heard about uh, the the Gulf War syndrome, uh, when about twenty percent of the personnel of uh, of the armed forces which were deployed there, uh, they were affected by debility, chronic uh, tissue damage, and a whole array of problems, uh, including uh, muscle pains, uh, respiratory problems, memory loss, vision problems, and so on and so forth. So this is this is quite a quite a huge problem, the war and the kind of pollution it creates and the money it swallows, which could be used for for a much uh, much better uh, much better purposes. Uh, the food wastage I just talked about it, and because the food wastage is also something to look at because we are looking at uh, in the world where about 700 million people. Uh, which is about 9% of the population, they live under extreme poverty and they are uh, living on $1.90 per day. And if we take uh, one-fifth of the population, which was which is 1.8 billion, they live uh, with uh, $3.20 per day. And two-fifths of the population, 3.2 billion, they live with uh, about uh, uh, five uh, under $5 a day or something like that. So this is we have to see this when we rethink and reset the economic system and global warming. We have to see it as a package. And it concerns the whole humankind, but those who are responsible, who are responsible for it, they must really bear the burden. You cannot, I remember one of the Dutch ministers a couple of months ago saying, because inflation is hitting us all, and we all have to realize and accept that. Uh, uh, that we all have become a little poorer. Now, that is very cynical observation or remark that uh, that uh, we all are becoming a little poorer uh, because uh, uh, if Jeff Bezos becomes a little poorer and from his $109 billion, he loses about 10%, that's not the same if someone earning 900 euros a month loses. Uh, uh, so he doesn't have to sell his car and eat less because uh, he has become a little poorer. Uh, this I have talked already. Uh, this I have also talked about it. So with that, I would like to to close this uh, our our uh, official session. And uh, I have to stop sharing screen. So we are back to the regular screen. Now, as uh, Amir Rana said in the beginning, while opening the meeting, that uh, we after ending of the official time of the meeting, we keep uh, the lines open for half an hour, 45 minutes for informal chat. People can discuss, talk, uh, network, uh, build their network, exchange views on the topic or maybe even off the topic. So we will stay online. And some people, if they thought, think uh, they have some questions but didn't get the opportunity to ask, so they can do that. So we stay on lines. You don't have to. But it will be nice to have a have a small post meeting chat uh, among all of us. So thank you very much. Talk, thank you, Dr. Mujib.
uh, for your contribution. Really, really appreciate it. And we hope uh, this is the start of a friendship with OPP for the rest of our lives. And <laughs> wonderful to have you uh, and wonderful to have everyone. So please feel free to contribute, uh, express your opinion, ask questions. Thank you. Yeah.